The Juneau World Affairs Council, in collaboration with KTOO, presents the 2024 Juneau World Affairs Forum, Political Authoritarianism on the Rise in the 21st Century. In this session, how can free societies forestall authoritarian takeover? A panel discussion exploring what free societies can do to strengthen democracy and forestall authoritarian movements, and how they should respond to propaganda, falsehoods, and political violence. I want to thank everyone again for being here, not only today, but also yesterday. I think we heard a lot of amazing information from the five panelists we have with us today. This is our last panel for this forum, and I think it will be more focused on calls to action, what we can do, what societies can do. And my plan is to start with a question from the audience. I will ask a few questions, and then we'll finish with a few more. So we had one question from last panel that has yet to be answered. So, Charles, if you'd like. Okay. <laughs> it was really good, yeah. yeah. Okay. So as I said last time, um, uh, as a, again, a member of a supranational organization in the Catholic Church, I'm a Catholic deacon, actually. Um, the, um, as I say, we're latecomers to the, to, the, to the table when it comes to democracy and the Enlightenment. Um, but one of the things that's come out of our engagement with these questions is Catholic social teaching, which could be summed up really in with two main ideas. One is upholding uh, the dignity of every person. Um, and secondly, working, finding ways to work together for the common good. And what I wanted to propose again in leading into the question would be um, for that reason, that is with that, from that framework of human dignity and the common good, um, I think that um, at least the Catholic Church looks at, at um, democracy in very instrumental terms um, uh, as probably the best way of achieving that. Not the only way in history, but the best way of achieving that particularly in our, our moment in time. Um, and so I, su I suppose the question that I, that I asked last time and that I'd ask now would be, um, one, is there a larger framework for us to look at democracy? Um, and is there, um, that democracy is not necessarily the goal, but the means or the instrument to those wider purposes? And might that not be a way of, um, of approaching how we defend democracy and resist um, authoritarian solutions or temptations? That'd be my question. Um, thank you, uh, Charles, for that, for, for really putting, putting the church on the table, because I think it raises um, a critical issue both in terms of, of possible solutions and also the current challenges. Um, one of the great strengths of the kind of pluralistic democracy that the United States has had with, with, has been you know, sort of robust uh, religious views existing not in lockstep with political parties, but at some uh, angles to it. So just to take a recent example where the, the, you know, the, the Pope was talking about limits to both presidential candidates on the one hand. I mean, I think it's unfortunate that Pope, who I'm a great admirer of, but you know, talked about the lesser of two evils. I mean, uh, I'm not sure that I like that, but, but clearly in terms of Catholic social teaching, um, having a Democratic Party and Democratic candidate very much pro-choice, having a Republican candidate very much hostile to immigration. Um, you know, this puts an independent moral voice, an independent policy voice, if you will, uh, in a supernatural, super national, as well as supernatural, I suppose, um, context really providing uh, a, a kind of substance for a democracy to um, wrestle with. 
and other religious institutions do can function the same way. I think one of the very unfortunate parts of American life over the and political life over the past, really since since 1990, um, has been a bifurcation politically along religious lines between the, between the Democratic and, and Republican parties. Um, it's not exclusively, but but there is a, 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 a sometimes called a God gap in which more religious people tend to vote Republican and less religious people tend to vote Democratic. And, and there is a considerable degree in which um, the most uh, observant of religious folks have moved in one political direction regardless of positions. And so, um, you know, you have Donald Trump uh, appearing at, at, at um, the Al Smith dinner the other day and, and, and Kamala Harris not, and then, and then having uh, uh, a pretty appalling speech, I think, by, by Trump at the dinner and, and a bunch of Catholic clerics sort of sitting there um, without objection. Um, and, and, and so I think we're in a bit of a kind of crisis of, of knowing how or, or having a polity which can make maximal and, and ideal use of the alternative voices that come from the religious community um, which have become increasingly subordinate, certainly in the evangelical Protestant world, uh, to, to one party. Um, thank you for this question. I think it's really important, and I interpret the question not necessarily as the, you know, whether we could get something out of religion to help our societies and to, you know, rethink about those norms and, and all that, but I, I think of your question as like, can we, uh, open the idea of democracy to other traditions, other, um, other, you know, uh, in a way, ha have more, uh, like more. Think of uh, think of it as like a more having more diverse uh, um, conceptualization of democracy. As long as we agree on the the fact that we should. Uh, keep hold up human dignity as well as uh, as the common good and i think um, um, the 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 path to sort of revive democracy as an idea that it's a good thing uh, passes through opening that conversation to other societies and other religions because in every religion there's some idea of like common good and human dignity um, and because we always um, you know tie democracy to this you know like western experience uh, enlightenment to hear and we have this conception conceptualization of like you know as you know democracy progresses modernization you know that the religion will die down and stuff like that maybe you know change that idea and open that 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 sort of discussion of democracy understanding regaining trust in 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 the societies and their traditions to come to those you know the the common good um, maybe it will be um, uh, much more humble, like in, in terms of like the Western approach to the rest of the world, because I mean, there are ideas that, that are norms, that are um, morals in each, as I said, culture, tradition, uh, religion. I mean, there one example, for instance, uh, maybe Maria can speak to that, like in, um, in Mexico, there are all these like local populations where they have like a very different understanding, more like local understanding of democracy. It's not like a democracy that is like um, sort of imposed or the, the, the ways in uh, the, the functions, the functions that you were like talking about, like from top, but they, they come up to um, um, an understanding of how things will shape within their own look localities and they could decide how they're gonna intervene with security issues or issues of like uh, distribution and this and that so and I think I think that's the way to um, 
bring get together with the with the with the democrats of the world you know in a way um, um, to 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 make this project is not just like american hegemony american you know we we shouldn't be worried about like the decline of democracy in this country because america is like losing its like you know position but we should think of it as an opportunity to come to an understanding where um you know that that our that our our, our nation is is see itself and maybe you know drives on other other sort of ideas of like thinking about that common good and um, and uh, and uh, you know human dignity. Yeah, I, I don't know if you have any uh, sort of examples that. Well, so you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? The, I can't remember their names, but there are these like Mexican sort of uh, local um, sort of uh, ways of practicing democracy that is not well, necessarily the liberal democracy. Comunidades, well, yeah. yeah, also in a lot of the work that I've done uh, with Guatemala, we always incorporate the indigenous voices, and their view of democracy is is very much about the community, the community being fed, the community being clothed, like very just, it's very, democracy is very communal and they, you know, they, it's very interesting to bring them into like traditional panels and conversations because they always, even before they speak or participate, they, they talk about the mother earth, uh, mm -hmm. they talk about the, the wellness of their community and um, yeah it's it's a very different view of, of democracy but not as individualistic as we've been talking about um, so yeah it's we do have those different views of democracy and and democracy being a vehicle uh, not only a vehicle but a, a means an end for people in 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 certain communities yeah for their well-being and rather than as a, you know, end game, you know. Exactly. Mm -hmm. well, I had a couple of thoughts. Uh, I mean, one, I don't see the contradiction between democracy and the common good. I, I mean, maybe, I'm not saying that you were implying it was a contradiction, but it seemed like one is not the avenue to get to the other one. It's Im I think it's embedded in the idea of conversation, which is the way I look at democracy. Now, I'm somebody that grew up in the church. Uh, I grew up, uh, my dad was a Lutheran minister. Uh, and so um, I know the church pretty well from the, uh, from the inside out. And even among Lutherans, you've got German Lutherans, you've got Norwegian Lutherans, and they all have different orientations. Uh, and my dad never did any God talk with me. You know, he, uh, uh, he was always sort of of the belief that the church was community to go back, I mean, that's, that's, what he, that's the way he felt it. You know, people need you and you, they need each other during these life crises that we all go through. Um, but the church itself was also a political battleground inside. Um, and uh, a lot of my generation that grew up in the church became very disaffected during the Vietnam War where we saw the leadership of most of the churches front and center supporting this invasion of another country. I mean, under the so-called saving this country from communism, whatever that was. Um, so we had, and so we became kind of alienated. Like, you know, you read the Sermon on the Mount, the last shall be first. Uh, and then you look at the foreign policy and, the, and what's going on. It didn't, it didn't compute. You felt like these are hypocrites. And so there was a, there was a real kind of alienation, but then also within the church that I experienced, there were struggles over the whole issue of gender identification. Um, the issue about uh, one of the things that, uh, that my dad's faction within the Lutheran Church did is they organized a formal apology to the Native American spiritual uh, leaders in, uh, in the Puget Sound region. And he still got that plaque up on the side. Um, and I think, I mean, initially, maybe 
people just said, render unto Caesar those things that are Caesar, and unto God those things that are God's. And it was sort of like a, it was kind of a cop out in some ways to ratify the status quo, I mean, during the Vietnam period. But then, um, you know, people started within the church breaking apart. Now, my dad got forced out of his congregation in uh, 1971. Part of it was due to me because I was an activist who got expelled from college in 1971 for disrupting the recruiting by a weapons manufacturer. And in the town, the mill town that I was in, um, you know, one night the church fathers or the sort of leaders, some of the church, they came over and just said, hey, Lowell, it's time for you to leave. And, uh, you know, he, he kind of fought him off for a while. Then he said, you know, I'm going to get another call someplace else. And so we had this fights going on inside. I watched, the, I watched during the process of debate and challenge. And I think part of what sparks the change is those people who are on the fringes who are willing to be exemplars and take the heat. And, and this, this is the role of, I guess you could call them sometimes, non-governmental actors, you know, just people who are activists, that small, that small sort of vocal minority is sometimes kind of irritating. It kind of breaks the consensus apart and, and shoves it. So I watched that evolution happen. Um, and, um, but I'm, I'm a little, but you know, then again, my parents were Republicans when they, my dad was originally from North Dakota. They were small, small government type Republicans, local control is best. So they came out here, or my dad did, my, uh, and, uh, and they were at the Republican Party meeting one time, I think it was in the early 1960s. And then one night, in come the fundamentalists, and they were organized, and they just came in, and they just took one night, they took over the whole Republican Party apparatus in the town of Everett. And, and they, were, they were like hardcore cadres. And, uh, and they were convinced that they were right. And uh, my parents were out. I mean, they got forced out. And eventually, they, the only home they could, I mean, they eventually ended up sliding over the Democratic Party. It wasn't that their values had changed, but they suddenly saw that uh, they had the same values, but these people did not represent those values anymore. So that fundamentalist experience that they had getting expelled from the Republican Party, even though they themselves were religious people, they, they weren't the hell, hell and damnation types, uh, I think that's always made me very leery in some ways about religion. Now, when I was getting kicked out of, out of school, uh, the one group that I worked with, and you know, they weren't overtly religious, but it was the uh, American Friends Service Committee, the Quakers. You know? And the Quakers, and it's odd that Richard Nixon was a Quaker, but the Quakers themselves were always on the ground you know, in, in situations. They were always supporting social justice movements. But they kind of let their actions do, were, their actions were their theology, sort of. Um, so I feel, you know, I feel like within, within the political, within the religious, religious sphere, it's almost as diverse as the political sphere because it's, it's not separate in some ways. Um, but, you know, I'm always nervous about my way or the highway or my revealed religion, um, you know, of course, you know, it was like we were, I think we were talking yesterday about God, Gott mit uns, you know, uh, on, the, on the helmets of all the German soldiers. And of course, we hear that every time an American politician speaks. You know, it's on our money. Um, you know, it's Constantinian Christianity, right? I mean, we're, we're Constantine made Christianity a, a state religion. Um, and so I don't really have a concise response to your question. I, I feel a number of different conflicting things, and I just, I just feel a need, a need for some kind of humility. Um, but I accept, I accept Islam, and, and, the, and, and uh, when I see what, what their works or what they do, and, and how they interact, or Buddhism, I don't, you know, I mean, I think there's, there's overlaps uh, and essential truths that are there. But the religion is never separate from the interpreters of the religion. I guess that's, there's no, there's no 
text that stands out there on its own, that's God's revealed truth. It's all being filtered to us as humans. I don't know, am I making any sense? I don't know if I'm getting to your question. I'm, I'm confused myself. <laughs> okay, I think we can switch gears. We'll continue with another easy, straightforward question. <laughs> This one, <laughs> this one comes straight from the program so everyone can follow along. How in a highly diverse and polarized society such as the United States do we build a governing consensus? And I actually, I'd actually like to start with Aicha and Tyler and Maria because your body of work focuses on areas outside the US and I want to know, are there lessons of what to do or what not to do from your respective areas of research? So we can start with Aicha. Uh, that's a very difficult question. I mean, I mean, I usually view things in terms of like history. Like, I, I mean, I don't, I don't have like good sort of answer like manuals or like to do, not to mm -hmm. do. Um, well. And I'm, I'm, I'm like Pete, I'm conflicted in many of these things, like one example, for instance, what not to do, or maybe to do, I, I don't know, like, so just going back to when President Erdogan, I mean, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, uh, was elected uh, in 2002, uh, a lot of people from the liberals, uh, so he comes from an Islamist party, Islamist tradition, political Islamist tradition that uh, sort of came to, uh, they organized themselves as a political party back in the late 60s. Um, of course, the Turkish secular state wasn't happy with them. They closed them uh, every now and then, military coups or the constitutional court. So he was that this new generation of that political Islamist party and his he split up with them and then he you know he said I'm no more a political Islamist I'm just like you know want to democratize Turkey da 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 so many liberals and leftists uh, jump on board and got him elected and supported him over uh, many many years so now the question is like I mean did could they know right that he wasn't so my, my dad and I I mean he's a my dad is a, also a politician um, and he spent a lot, a lot of time. He was a mayor in Ankara, uh, in one of the uh, regions, and uh, you know, and his his council was like composed of like political Islamists, uh, right wing, and his his own party's uh, members. So he would tell me like, you know, you think that they're going to democratize Turkey, but these people cannot do that. I mean, it's not they're not they're they're not democrats. They're not the, the way they see the world. The way they operate it's not that and we always like clash right but I would always tell my dad oh you're so like you know uh, stuck with your ideas like just pe give people a chance you know you can only democratize Turkey by bringing in people who are excluded from the system in so that they could start to uh, you know start a dialogue think about the policy you know all that stuff but I mean now I, I, I visit that those conversations I mean it's like he was right but I, I, I mean I wouldn't know. I mean, nobody, like it, things could have been evolved in a very different way if Turkey was accepted in the EU. And I mean, we could be like Hungary, not like Turkey, like, you know, like it, it could have been a different thing. So it's like a very historical, it's contextual, like, you know, I mean, I wish we were right and he was wrong, but that didn't happen so but I can't really generalize out of this experience like oh you know liberals left leftists should not should be very sort of careful about who they include in the system I mean it's like you know it's very historical at the end of the day uh, but like we're at a different moment like very similar to that actually and now they are like this um, the, the, the government uh, of Erdogan, President Erdogan, would like to get some constitutional changes through. And now they're giving a little bit of like sort of power to Kurds, maybe starting a dialogue again with the Kurdish groups. And we're all like very excited about it. Oh, but there may, that maybe this is the peace process again starting. But it's probably not. But who would know, right? <laughs> like, it's because we have to stick to every every hope of improvement and that's that we don't get many of those <laughs> so um, so it's a historical thing for me um, yeah 
Um, yeah, I'm a historian. It's historical <laughs> for me too. Uh, I'm a historian of the Soviet Union. So, um, I mean, I, I, that was a, the October Revolution, both February, well, so the dual revolutions, February 1917 and October 1917, um, ultimately yielded in a liberal um, authoritarian state. Some people would like to use the word totalitarian. Um, needs a lot of contextualization. But um, ultimately, I think that um, the revolutions that unfolded in the beginning of the 20th century in uh, the former Russian Empire um, were shaped by war and revolution and took place in highly diverse places. I mean, this is a, a multi-ethnic, multilinguistic, uh, multilingual, uh, multi-confessional <laughs> empire. Um, and then you have the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Empire in 1991. Also, multi, uh, highly diverse uh, empire and highly diverse region. Um, and so the, the struggle um, in building post-socialist, post-Soviet democracies in the region was, from the get-go, addressing uh, diversity of each region. I mean, when the Soviet Union fell apart, it fell apart along uh, the national lines that were built um, into the system um, in the 20s. And so when it falls apart, you still are left, I mean, you have Kazakhstan, right? But there are still many different um, ethnic groups, nationalities in, in these different regions. Um, I mean, even Ukraine today is a great example of, uh, of an uh, independent uh, nation state that has uh, more than just Ukrainians living in it, just like the United States. And so um, diversity um, and democracy don't necessarily go hand in hand, um, but it, they are, it is a fundamental question of how, how to um, fit everybody into a civil society, into a democracy, into a nation state. And, um, and the historical empires that I've studied provide great, I think, um, warnings and counterexamples to the democratic, liberal democratic project that unfolded in, in North America. It's a it's tough, easy question. yeah, I so easy, <laughs> straightforward. It's very straightforward. Um, I think, well, when I think of Latin America, I think about, it's a young con continent. Um, and I go back to the youth and how disenchanted they've been with, with democracy, but also how a political and apathetic they've been, um, and you know there's there are networks of civil society um, in the countries, but but there's no I think until we manage to change um, those sentiments with with the young people, I think it'll be hard to get things back on track in the region. Um, I think about like 2019, you were, you were in Chile when the protests exploded and, and we were seeing a sort of um, like a malaise contagion. Uh, at first it was, I think, Bolivia, then Chile, then Argentina, and then COVID hit. And then, you know, that, the effects of COVID on on social groups and and the young people, especially, uh, we're still dealing with that. Um, I also think about like Nicaragua and how Daniel Ortega has been able to every year after year, his grip on power is just stronger, and he has managed to fly under the radar because the international community is focused on Venezuela and Cuba to a lesser degree. But Nicaragua, nobody really cares about Nicaragua because there's nothing there. There's no oil. There's, you know, it's just a country in Central America. But um, the, the business community supported him and they were quiet when he started to show these tendencies of authoritarianism. And when they started to speak out, it was too late. It was in 2018 when protests erupted because Ortega and, and his wife, Rosario Murillo, were 
proposing uh, cuts to Social Security that would affect everyone. Uh, and so students took to the streets and they protested and it was horribly repressive. Lots of, I think like over 300 students died in, in those protests. And then the, international, the private sector realized that, oh, maybe we should have spoken up earlier. But they were behind his, his candidacy back in, uh, I think it was like 2009. So my point with that is that there are, the question, like, that there are different groups of interest that n need to understand their role in the democratic project of, of their nation. And, and that I think that several social and cultural things that have happened over the last years where we're lonelier, like we've been talking about, where we don't have roots, we don't have a community, have really affected that like collective project. For the United States, I have a very simple one word answer. Finally, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the word's Alaska, which is to say ranked voting. Um, if democracy is about conversation, and the problem, um, a central problem that we're facing in the country is polarization, then there has to be a way, a po partisan polarization. There has to be a better way for people to communicate across party lines to, and to have politicians who are able to have those conversations. And from what I hear during my visit, or visit to, to Juneau, um, that is happening in the Alaska legislature, that the coalitions that, ex that have been formed as a result of this change to the way uh, candidates are selected has made a significant difference. And I think, I think you have to think in terms, one has to think in terms of, uh, if, if it's possible, of of ways of adjusting the system. I mean, we've talked about um, the problems of having elective, an elected judiciary uh, in Mexico, or the potential problems. And you know, you can say, well, that's just a small change. You know, in a system, we still have judges. We, but the consequential, the potential consequences of doing that can be huge. And I think. I think change, pushing against the kinds of um, dug-in position, po polarized positions of the parties is a central problem to what we're dealing with now here. And I think ranked voting, jungle primaries, ways in which you're appealing to the, where, where candidates are appealing to the constituency as a whole, as opposed to simply the people who turn out in one party for a for, for a primary can be, can be huge. Now, of course, there are many people who oppose that, but that's at least what I would offer. To, to your point about the judiciary, I remember this Italian author, uh, Tommaso di Lampedusa, in, uh, many years ago, but Il Gatto Pardo, which is a seminal piece of uh, Italian literature, but there's a line in there of, uh, if we want nothing to change, everything must change. So you give this illusion of, you know, we're radical democracy, we're gonna elect all the judges, it's gonna be, you know, people are gonna have a say in who's dealing with justice problems in our country. And so you change the whole thing completely, but nothing's gonna change because who's gonna end up in these, those positions? When you say that, I'm reminded of uh, Naomi Klein's book, Shock Doctrine, mm -hmm. you know, that when, uh, all of a sudden, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna, something big happens, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, the organized powers that are out there, you got the yeah. masses of the population that are not organized, and the organized groups that, that can profit from that will intervene mm -hmm. and radically force through things that, you know, you would never, I mean, 9-11, uh, you think about the uh, Patriot Act, and, and all the rollbacks on civil liberties, or you think about Edward Snowden's book, Permanent Record, uh, you know, when he was in the NSA, and all of a sudden he finds out they're surveilling the entire American population. 
I mean, clear violations of the Fourth Amendment. Um, so they take, advantage, they take advantage of these things. Mm. I mean, again, I go back to the fact that we've got this bifurcated situation in the United States where you essentially have an economic dictatorship. Uh, and on top of that, you still have a, politi a formal political democracy. And, but the economic choices and the way the country's going, it's like you're on a super tanker on autopilot. And someone's got to go to Baltimore Harbor. Yeah, somebody's <laughs> got to turn that autopilot over, off, and, and use some, I mean, steer around these obstacles. But that's why it's important for there be organized groups out there that are separate from the economic system right now that's really guiding the, guiding the whole thing. Now, how you do that, I don't know. I mean, I just know that, say, at my community college where I teach, um, the, the school is much better when you have the employees and the faculty organized. And they can come together and do what's best, as opposed to just leaving it to that cadre of administrators who are on top, you know, because they're on autopilot. They'll go a certain direction. So organization, small groups, different groups, I think that's, that's pretty critical to, I don't know if it's a governing coalition, but it's, uh, it's at least you're trying, to, you're trying to get the steering wheel and drive things in a humane direction that benefits the majority of the population. This ties into my next question, which is about individual action. So what can we as individuals here in Alaska or people who are watching wherever, what can we do as individual people to forestall the arrival of authoritarianism? We'll start with, well, you've kind of answered. Do you want to say anything else? <laughs> well, and I yeah. mean, uh, I, I don't want to take up a lot of space, but just uh, uh, information education. Mm. You know, the problem with information education, you know, like every day I'm watching the nightmare that's going on in Gaza, it, and it's just horrific. It's a, it's a crime against humanity, and my government is, is uh, make, enabling that. Is it better for me to, like, torture myself to read that information every day? Uh, so, you know, I guess I, I do things like I write letters to senators and congressmen, or I, I, I try to do something like that. But inform yourself, um, and then also whatever association you happen to be in. I don't care if it's the Republican Party or the Democrat Party, or Democratic Party, uh, you know, or if it's your church, your civic organization. You know, you have to take whatever's closest to you and get involved in it, and get act and get active. I mean, I mean we're doing it right now. Okay. We're, we're talking, uh, having conversations, uh, having conversations with people outside of your bubble, um, being being neighborly, um, engaging in civic and uh, civil public discourse. Um, reading, <laughs> being information literate, uh, sharing with other people I think is another key thing and, and um, asking questions. I mean, don't just uh, preemptively submit to whatever institution or information ahead of time. I believe in the organizational power too, but unfortunately I think in the US we work too much. I I live in the Bay Area, maybe it's better out here. Um, but we have kids, we raise our kids ourselves, like we don't have, you know, extended family. Um, so, and we work all the time. There's not much time for organizational things, like, and those things need an effort, like, you know, time. Um, so unfortunately, I mean, in, in many, I think, cities where you have two parents working with small kids or, you know, um, kids, it's hard to find time for those, uh, for those organizational things, let alone like find time to read and have like some understanding of, yeah. But I, I mean, you know, in California, we have, we usually get really long um, ballots, right? And I'm like, I'm new to the US, I don't have like this very 
you know, grounded understanding of what's going on. And I deal with Turkish politics every day for my work, for my, you know, uh, because that's what I'm really interested in too. Um, so I, I don't have much time, so I get some information. But for instance, like there are some organizations that release like their, you know, um, like vote choices, like who to vote for. You know, they are like really um, concise information. Like, and th there's some organizational power behind that. And I draw on those when I'm like trying to figure out who to vote. Uh, but I would love to get ranked choice, you know. Uh, I always like make fun of my husband. Yeah, you have the, you know, the, 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 you know, the largest democracy or whatever, but you don't have that many choices here. Although it's like a long ballot, it's like, you know, either Democrat, Republican, <laughs> I, I don't know, like, <laughs> you know, it's like, um, you know, so it will be nice to um, give some power to people to make choices also um, uh, behind certain or beyond certain interests. Um, so two things like organizational organizations, uh, a little less work and more time for for people to to join them, participate, and then also maybe a little um, outside this uh, two-party system. Um, I think that will help with uh, democracy, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I just I I do think, you know. Speaking personally and, and as an observer, it is not always easy to have conversations with neighbors with whom you disagree politically. Sure. Um, we ha happen to have um, neighbors who we're in many ways very cl close to. Um, we've lived to you know a, you know next door for over twenty five years. It, um, there's a lot of gardening that, that you know, consultation, and, and they're musicians from Yale, and we're musicians, and all of that stuff. Um, Gretchen shows up with, with a brand new Trump uh, Vance hat, and it's like, you know, the old line in the bar, no conversations about politics and religion. You know, we're not, we're not gonna do that. And, we will talk religion with them, but um, it's, it's a challenge. I just saw a news story about somebody with a, with a Trump sign and, and somebody drove by a neighbor and was blasting anti-Trump sounds against them and the people came out of the house and fired seven shots into the car. Um, so <laughs> I'm not saying that's gonna happen all the time, but uh, but I, I think, you know, neighbor to neighbor conversations about this stuff is, uh, is not even, you know, when you're not talking about people picking, you know, pulling guns, is not easy. And neighborliness often urges you to put that issue aside and deal, you know, building community is good but it doesn't solve the political problem. I agree, I think you've got to, sometimes you just have to suspend, you have to, okay, you know, this person's walking around with Fox News in their head, this person's walking around with MSNBC in their head, you know, is that gonna be a productive conversation if that's the level you're gonna, you're gonna talk at? So what I always find is, you gotta find points in your common world that you can work together on. And then in the process of working together, there's a little transformation that goes on. You know, it's about alliance building, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you know. No, I, th I, th I think it's a, it's, a, it's a real problem that we, um, the idea, if I can use this term in the general sense of intersectionality, that you have to be allied with, the only people you can be allied with are the people who agree with you down the line. Mm -hmm. Traditional politics, in this country, when the, when the parties were not so ideologically aligned, always meant putting together coalitions across party lines. And as I understand it, that is actually happening in Alaska now. Um, am I wrong? It's happening. Well, and, 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 the, and I, think, I think that kind of institution, that's the institutional pro progress that at least with the problems we have in, the country, in this country doesn't apply everywhere, but it, 
Um, I, th I think that's really healthy because so much of our discourse now is emotionally and ideologically driven where you have people, say, in West Virginia voting for people who voted against interest, infrastructure legislation that they desperately need. Mm -hmm. That's not in their interest. They, you know, we, I mean, in any concrete way unless, you know, so, uh, so that's what I'm for. <laughs> I want to check before we go to questions. Maria, do you have anything to add? No. Okay, it's time for questions. Does anyone have a question? Okay, Eric, please step up. So uh, we've seen a lot of, uh, a lack of trust in institutions. Uh, and I'm curious if you guys have seen societies that have successfully rebuilt trust in institutions um, and any lessons that we might be able to learn from them. I know that's sort of similar to a question that we asked earlier, but I'm, I would love to know. I, I would say West Germany after World War II would be an example. I mean, their institutions were devastated. Uh, you know, although many of the people that were in power during the Nazi period <laughs> continued on in government in West Germany at the same time. And yet, I mean, I was, I was a person who spent some time there in 1975 and 77. I felt like their society at that time overall was more democratic than the United States um, in terms of you know, and it was also the, lo the level of anxiety was much lower. You know, when I stayed with a bunch of German students in Berlin, they'd get up in the morning and enjoy their breakfast, you know? I mean, it was like, they weren't like an American like me, like, go, 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 I gotta get, time's wasting. Uh, because they had their basic needs taken care of. They didn't have to worry about paying for college, you know, medical stuff. And so there was a level at which they could engage intellectually and artistically because they didn't have to worry about some of that stuff. But anyway, that's, that's an example to me of a place that, I mean, because Germany never had a successful democratic revolution in its history. You know, they had Bismarck when we had Lincoln. Um, you know, they have a whole, I mean, they, we had FDR when they had Hitler. Uh, and so they were coming out of an authoritarian tradition. And, and uh, yeah, I, I think that's, that's an example. I mean, they've still got their, they've got their problems, but that's an example of where they, they actually built it up, you know? And so I was, I was impressed by it. I don't know, maybe you could, maybe someone has something about South Africa, you know, after apartheid. I mean, the, no. <laughs> uh, I think that there's a, there is a, has been a healthy distrust of institutions and government in the, that I have personally observed in uh, post-Soviet Russia um, over the years. Um, I was there when Medvedev was president for like 10 minutes um, before I switched back to Putin. Um, and then I've been there um, under the Putin regime. Um, and I think that ordinary people um, it would be like naive to trust in institutions. Yeah, and it depends on what kind of institutions. Like in many places, like for, like Turkey, like military is, has been the most trusted institution for um, years, despite the um, their bad influence on democracy every now and then. Um, but you know, now that it's disseminated um, as a as an institution that needs to be trusted. I mean, I, th I guess like part of the trust in the, in the military is that the trust that they could sort of intervene when the guardrails were kind of going down for keeping the, you know, democracy, like elections or, you know, uh, civil government. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't, in, in the country that I, s I know the most, uh, there hasn't been, a period where um, we regain trust, like more vertical trust. Um, but also like it's a matter of like public opinion polls. In many places we don't have public opinion polls like in the US where you like constantly like measuring trust. Oh, it's two points down, five points down. You know, it's like, so um, how do you measure that, right? Um, that's also a question of, um, of, of that, yeah. 
Uh, real quick to piggyback off something directly related. I mean, you, you see all of these, um, we'll be on YouTube shortly, so all of these YouTube videos of people being interviewed uh, on the street in Russia, like do you support uh, Vladimir Putin or do you trust the government or whatever? And of course people are gonna say yes. I mean, <laughs> people are doing uh, time for say, holding up a sign that says no to war. Uh, I mean, so I just think those opinion polls are, at least in the Russian, in a, in an, a liberal democracy, illiberal um, democracy, uh, authoritarian state, like there's no way, it's really hard to get at. And under the Soviets, the, the KGB was obsessed with quote unquote mood reports, like trying to, to garner the mood of the people and guess what it was. and and figure out how people really felt about state socialism. I mean, it was something that they never were able to but figure out. I want to add something. I mean, I don't want to be like that pessimistic that, oh, we can't have trust anymore. I mean, these things change. I mean, people adopt, people get a little bit of information. There's a little bit of discussion and they change their views. I mean, it's not like a huge task to build a trust if you have properly functioning institutions mm -hmm. where which uh, take care of people right it's not a, like we're we're not doomed to lose trust to to zero and never <laughs> you know mm -hmm. i think these things change i mean people's opinions i mean on the one hand it's hard to change and on the other it's not that hard if you have the institutions if you are, if they see some sort of progress improvements um, yeah, so I'm not pessimistic, um, although I don't have a good historical example to give you. Yeah. I was just going to say that, you know, institutions are made up of people. Mm. And in the case of Latin America, I, c I can think maybe of Chile after Pinochet. Mm. I mean, it was for a very long time, Chile was uh, like an exemplary country for its security, safety. Things are different now, but um, you know your example of Russia, YouTube. <coughs> I think if you ask the Salvadorian today if they trust the institutions that you know have given them back their freedom of movement and all these other things, they might say yes. And mm -hmm. it's not something that they did with the the recent period where they were alternating between two very corrupt governments. Um, so, and then in Latin America, I think at, af at the end of the day, it's, it's not the military, but the church has al always been mm -hmm. kind of the institution that uh, is the most respected, um, although that's changed recently, but. We have three minutes left. Another so that question. means we have time for, I think, one more question and we have it. Thank you. about uh, the problems of a democracy and of an autocracy. And I'm sitting here with a question about, does anybody have any idea on how to structure a government or government processes on how to ensure installation of a benevolent dictator? <laughs> I don't know if there's one that's existed in history. Uh, that's my answer. <laughs> or benevolent, I don't, yeah, that's hard. I, I would suggest reading Plato's Republic, but, um, <laughs> but my answer would be no, personally. I, I think we're stuck with the old adage, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. You know, or there was a book called The Iron Law of Oligarchy. Mm. You know, that there are these inherent tendencies. Well, it's, it's just, you know, there's these inherent tendencies that are always potentials that we have to be aware of and, and recognize when they happen. So I don't know if you can reconcile benevolence with dictatorship. I mean, maybe, it's like maybe. An oxymoron. What's that? It oxymoron? Sounds, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you're asking for it if you think you can do that, you know. I think we'll be doomed if we expect salvation from one person. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, going back to what we have been talking about, we need collective um, collectivity and collectives, and, or you know, organization and society, community. 
Um, yeah, I don't. I wouldn't trust my uh, my kid's future to one person, even is the best, you know. And things change, you know. Good people can become bad people. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so um, yeah, no, no to benevolent dictators. No. <laughs> Let me offer one possible exception, and that's to take a look at uh, some of the uh, um, Emirates. Uh, uh, in the Middle East, where uh, again all social needs are taken care of by the government, uh, uh, only the very um, superficial uh, examples of democratic democratic institutions, but uh, where citizens um, have traded off their civil rights for uh, economic security. That's a lot to think about. Thank you, Bruce. We have no time left. So thank you for everyone for being here today and yesterday. And we can continue the conversation, but let's give everyone a round of applause. Thank you. That was a panel discussion on how can free societies forestall authoritarian takeover. It was recorded October 19, 2024 at KTOO on the unceded territories of the Ak Kwan on Hlinke Ani as part of the 2024 Juno World Affairs Forum, Political Authoritarianism on the Rise in the 21st Century. Produced by KTOO and the Juno World Affairs Council. With support from Core Alaska Kensington Mine, 